So before I start, uh, I would like to share something with you. I didn't plan on sharing this. The Spirit prompted me, so I shall. On the 1st of August, well, 1st and 2nd of August, we had an Acts 29 conference. It was called the Intensive Healthy Leaders, Healthy Churches. And it was here in this building. On the 1st of August, uh, a pastor named Zerubbabel, Pastor Z if you want to, from Ethiopia, spoke about evangelism. And he spoke about removing the obstacles between Jesus and people. Right? Like that's the reason for evangelism. Is we want to show people Christ because Christ gives us access to the Father. But there are things that keep people from seeing Christ. And the simple task of evangelism is to knock over, he used his fingers, to, to knock over those obstacles and to remove it in front of people's eyes so that they can see Christ. Phenomenal, I think, way of thinking about evangelism. So the next morning we go back on the 2nd of August. We went into the time of worship. It was fire, let's be honest. I'm quite surprised to see that the roof is still here. And as we were in worship, I saw a vision. Now, my gifting is not to see visions. My gifting is to be a teacher of the word. But I saw a vision that morning. And that vision has motivated me. Well, it shook me first, as visions do. And it motivated me second. And it still keeps me motivated. So here's what I saw. I saw Jan Shoba, this uh, road leading up here, running north-south all the way to Brooklyn Circle. And Jan Shoba was backed up, like mad, mad traffic here from south all the way to Brooklyn Circle, both lanes on both sides, backed up and at a complete standstill. Proper job, Pretoria, winter's day, low visibility, lots of dust and smoke drifting in. Look, winter in Pretoria is not that beautiful now, is it? But proper winter's day, and I was walking on the middle man, I don't know if that's a great English word, the island that separates the lanes, and I reached Linwood. So I was standing uh, uh, with my back towards Linwood, looking up to Brooklyn Mall, Brooklyn Circle, and just seeing this madness going on around me. And everyone were in the cars, everyone was in their cars, and all the cars had rolled up windows. And everyone in the cars were really anxious because they felt suffocated. But no one could see. So in front of everyone's windscreen, there was just all these obstacles. So imagine people trying to peep out the window, trying to see what's going on and why no cars are moving. But no one can see. And no one can roll down their windows and ask. And I stood on the island trying to figure out what should I do because it See, it's clear as daylight to me that everyone is really anxious. No one can see. It's, we really have low visibility in the city, so no one knows what's going on in Brooklyn Circle. And if you turn around, no one knows what's going on on the corner of South and Yan Shoba. It was, it was a terrifying experience for me. And as I looked, I saw the Spirit of the Lord sweep like one movement. <coughs> But, and it hit, like it, think Dolby 7.2, IMAX, the Grove, times 10, do you know what I mean? Like the sound, I was, I was looking towards Brooklyn Circle, and I saw the Spirit of the Lord move, and it went, and it just obliterated all those obstacles in front of people. It smashed it to pieces, and in one sweep, it was all gone, all the obstacles. And the weather turned, it was so clear, so clear. Think October, after a high felt thunderstorm in Pretoria. The next day is always the most beautiful day in Pretoria because the sky is, I see skies of blue. <laughs> and Jan Shoba was beautiful in the summer. It's filled with jacarandas, brooks, Anderson, Marie, Marais, all those streets. But, and it happened like this. And the moment the spirit swept through those cars, smashed all those obstacles, everyone breathed. And when everyone breathed, everyone could see. And when everyone could see, everyone calmed down. And when everyone calmed down, there was a presence of a Brooklyn circle leading up to that hill in Grunklo, Fort Klapperkop, 
of the Father just being manifested and people actually able to see. And then my vision ended. God cannot only do that. He wants to do that. That's the revival we're talking about. And that's what we trust in God to do. And I stood there that morning crying and shaking and going, please, Lord Jesus, do this in our time. Because there's so many things that make people not see. There's so many obstacles to people seeing the Father. And it just gets added. It doesn't get less. But your spirit can break and smash all those things. And we'll have a clear and a new revelation of you. I cannot tell you the joy I experienced when I heard human beings go, Oh! Just the life entering back into people. It was a phenomenal vision. And I had to share it with you guys now. Because I was reminded of it. But that's what I'm believing God wants to do and will do in our time. And that's what I believe He wants to awaken us to. And that's what I believe we should press into and we should trust Him to do. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you a question. What makes you feel loved? It will be on the screen. Hashtag, think love languages. Right? Love languages are great. It gives us a little handle to talk about love. What makes you feel loved? Is it like acts of service? Someone doing something for you? Words of affirmation? Top job? I love you. You look phenomenal tonight. The gift and spending of quality time? Receiving a physical gift, that's also a love language, or showing love as well, or physical touch. Like, what makes you feel loved? Just think about it for a second. If you are an achiever, there's a bonus question for you as well, just to make sure. When did you feel loved this past week? It's maybe good to reflect on our own experiences. Hashtag, someone got it right. Tuck that one away for later. Let's read. Uh, I would like you to open up your Bibles in 1 John, or 1 John if you want to, chapter 1, verse 5, and we'll read to chapter 2, verse 2. I'll be using the Christian Standard Bible tonight, so if you're reading from cell phone, CSB is the uh, abbreviation for the Christian Standard Bible. Let's read. This is the words of our Father. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light and there's absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, I am writing to you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He Himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. This is the Word of God to us tonight. Now, you might not know John. You might know a John, but you might not know the John. So let me show you a slide. Just to answer the question, what do we have here? might seem obvious to you, but let me just make sure that we're all on the same page. What we have here is a letter written from a man called John. It doesn't read like a letter. It reads like a sermon. But you've got John on the left. Artist impression, not a real photo. Just by the way. And John wrote to the church. Okay? He was overseeing house churches. He was stationed in the area of Ephesus. And you'll see that he experienced crises in the church that he pastored. Okay, so let's read it together. Uh, A group of people left the church and denied Jesus as the Messiah. They generated hostility. And John writes this letter 
is to do some damage control, okay, and to assure the churches. Our best guesstimate is that this is the same John that shared three years with Jesus during his public ministry, his disciple. He also referred to himself as the beloved disciple. Okay, John's love language is words of affirmation. Okay? <laughs> so he referred to himself as the beloved disciple. He wrote to churches full of people who struggled with discouragement. And they were discouraged mainly for two reasons. One, their own sinful failures. We just, we're not getting this right. And the other one was the presence of false teachers in their midst. People teaching and saying things that made them doubt their faith. Anybody? Like, are we here? Or doesn't this sound familiar to us as a church? We are in an interesting time of the year as a church and as a people and as a country. This time of year in South Africa is the time when depression spikes, where suicide spikes, where separation spikes, where divorces spike, where people leave what is known to them or what they're busy struggling with. Because the way that we do life in South Africa is actually unattainable, right? In January, we're all going to be the best people ever. And then we think if we hustle hard through the whole year, we'll make it in December and achieve everything that we want to achieve in Jan. And then we get to August and we go, my word, why on earth is this so difficult? And we get despondent and we get discouraged. And that's not only true of people in the church, that's also true of the people in our country. I mean, just try and read public discourse at the moment. It's really negative and really vile and really discouraging. Now, I know there are some websites with good news. Praise Jesus for them. I'm talking in general. So we know that the struggle is real. We know that legs are tired. We know, if I can hoist some vernac in here, that oaks are pup this time of year. I mean, if I would ask you now, how are you doing? You'll probably say, yeah, I'm good. How about yourself? And then I'll also say, yeah, like, I'm good. But below the surface... We are experiencing the paradox of life. It's a simple truth. And here's the paradox of life. God loves us. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He showed us mercy. He forgave us our sins. He called us to be part of His family. He's got a great, great, great plan and mission for our lives. He'll achieve His purposes through us. Eventually, He'll judge everything and everyone. He'll make the whole world new. That is true. And then what is also true on this side is that everyday life can be hard. Working a job can be hard. Being married can be really hard. <laughs> Ask my wife, you know, being married to me. It's hardcore. You did well though, for 10 years. Thank you, love. I really do appreciate that. Words of affirmation, guys. Do you see that happening yet? <laughs> no, I'm joking. But raising kids is hard. Being part of family, both spiritual and blood family, is hard. Wanting stuff and not achieving it is hard. Praying for stuff and not seeing it come to fruition is hard. Yeah. And that's also true. But you see, here's the thing. In terms of the paradox of life, this one never changes. Wow. And that's where our hope and our strength should lie in this time. Because this one here yeah, will always change. And sometimes it'll be great and sometimes it won't be. And most of the times we'll kind of languish here in the middle. But this one stays the same every single day. And in a time like this, this is where we should put our trust. We should put our trust in God Himself who cannot and will not fail. Yeah, amen. And how do we know this? Well, the death of Jesus is a really, really good place to start. Why? Because through the death of Jesus, in this portion of Scripture that we read now, God kept His promises. He did what He said He would do. Through the death of Jesus. And if we can study this text tonight. And we see that God is faithful to do what he said he's going to do. Then that should rejuvenate us. And that should revitalize us. And that should immediately make us go from inwardly focused. And just worrying about ourselves. To being outwardly focused. And think about what God can do in the lives of people. If he did this for not only us but for everyone. Even those who do not believe it yet. This is a great portion of Scripture, and it's great news. So as we work through the teaching text tonight, I want to answer three questions, and we'll put them up on the screen for you. How do cleanse, forgive, and sacrifice fit together? Because we saw these three words. I'll show you again now. Two, what does atoning or atonement mean? I mean, it's one of those words that's in the Bible. It's a really important word. But none of us probably used it this week when we were WhatsApping people, some funny memes or whatever. 
hey, maybe we should start a string of atonement memes and like get it back into normal <laughs> English, you know? And then the third question is, did Jesus die because God was angry or because he loves us? I think that's a really, really important question. And I'll tell you why when we get there. So let's look at the first one. How do we, uh, how do cleanse, forgive, and sacrifice fit together? So three uh, just excerpts from the teaching text. One, seven, one, nine, and two, two. They should be up there. Look at that. Bold and underlined. It's not a new translation. That's my own edits. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So cleanse twice and the word forgive. And then verse 2, he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, How do these three things fit together? Because we need to understand this if we want to understand why Jesus had to die for us and also what that means. So maybe the illustration is helpful. I also know that it's Friday night. Okay, hashtag John Food Friday. So I'm going to show you a picture of two hamburgers. I want to buy a hamburger. So join me for a hamburger at the table. Let's pretend that we go out for a burger. This is not plant-based protein. It's real meat, just to say it. And that's a chicken by the Galen. Guys, your weekly vegan reference. Like, we have to do that. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Let's say we go for a burger. We have a phenomenal time. We have a good conversation. And then at the end of us eating together we're all done and then you tell me dude I forgot my wallet I'm really sorry I can't pay for my burger okay so let's say we said in the beginning that everyone is paying for themselves this is kind of awkward now isn't it I mean we had a great vibe going here and now you drop this one on me and now there's some dirt between us like, you just defiled the relationship. It was a great experience. I wasn't going to wash my hands. I was going to smell the meat for the rest of the afternoon. But now I know that I'm going to pay way more than I wanted to. And you knew that you were supposed to bring a wallet. So what do we do now? Now, let's pretend I say to you, it's not an issue. I forgive you. It's quite okay with me that you forgot your wallet. And then you say to me, well, thank you. Cheers, I really appreciate that. That might sort out the awkwardness between us. But can you imagine the waiter pulls up and then I say to the waiter, listen, so he forgot his wallet, but I want you to know that I forgave him. (laughs) It's cool between us. What what do you guys think the waiter's going to say? He might say, well, there's a lot of bromance going on here, but there's a bill. Someone needs to pay. Like you forgiving him for the fact that you forgot his wallet doesn't settle the bill. Yeah, sure. Someone has to pay. Yeah. This is the way it works. You took something, you scoffed it down, and now you have to pay. Mm. It's a given. You knew it before you came into the restaurant. You cannot say that you didn't know. It's how it's always been. I mean, everyone in this room at least knows that that is how a restaurant works. There's a price, and there's a sacrifice. And now you're pretending as if you didn't know. Or maybe saying that I knew, but I didn't bring it, still won't settle the bill. It's a hard truth now, isn't it? I mean, you knew that you were were going to have to pay. And now you can't. And now I have to. And we are not going to leave until that's done. It's a hard truth. Look at some hard truths in this passage with me. So keep your Bible open, please. Look at verse 5. God is light. And there is absolutely no darkness in him. That is the truth. Look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. It's a hard truth. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Look at verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Look at 2 verse 1. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Just looking at these verses, it is as clear as daylight. My dear brother and sister, or Y'all, 
that you owe something. In exactly the same way that if you sit at your table after you ate the burger, it is as clear as daylight that you owe something towards the world. You can't argue with that. So what will you do? What will you do? Now John says there's a way out. He says in this portion of scripture, or in this letter that he wrote to the churches, there is something that can cover for you. Because remember, the people are discouraged. Their own sinful failures are making them walk away. They feel tired of trying again and again and again. And they believe the lie that I've said sorry too many times. Or I've failed too many times. Or at some point God is going to go, I'm not ever going to have a burger with you again because you keep on forgetting your wallet. And now John says, no, listen. There's a way out here for you. There's something that can cover for you. Okay, let me be honest with you. There's a price to pay. Yeah. Yeah. But someone pay for you. Yeah. And then John uses not financial language like settling the bill or paying the price. He doesn't use relational language like forgiveness and reconciliation. He uses Old Testament language. Yeah. Why? Because John was obviously steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. A Hebrew and Aramaic speaker himself living in a Greek world and writing in Greek. And now John uses language from the Old Testament when he describes who Jesus was. And he says this, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Oh, hallelujah. Now let's ask the question then. What does atoning or atonement mean? Now, I'm going to put it on the slide for you. You might think that I'm doing word gymnastics here. And taking the English word and passing it to say something that I wanted to say. But I do want to invite you to go and consult Miriam Webster or the Oxford Dictionary. And they'll tell you that atonement, rightly passed, actually is at one month. That's where the word comes from. And at one month means to make right or to reconcile. There's two parties and there's division. Think of the burger. You forgot your bill. So how do we get at one again? Well, through atonement. And how do we sort that out? Well, someone has to pay the bill, like for us to be fixed again and to be okay. And there needs to be cleansing and there needs to be forgiveness because remember those three hold together. So we need to say what dirty the relationship and then I need to forgive you and then we need to pay the bill. Okay, so cleansing, forgiveness and sacrifice fit together. And now... John says that Jesus was the thing, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, that made at one moment between us and God. Just to show you guys that I did study at a reputable university. I am going to give you a Greek and a Hebrew word for today. So the Greek word, hilasmos, is a translation of the Hebrew word, kiper. And the Hebrew word kiper means more than just settling the bill. It means to cover someone's failure. It means to erase debt. Listen, not put a down payment structure for a debt. Wipe it. Garnish. And to purify the relationship. If you have one of those old school desk planners, you might see at the Jewish holy days, you might see Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement. The day in which the Jewish people celebrate this atonement. Okay? Well, not the Christian atonement, but atonement according to the Old Testament law. But that's what it means. And now John says, the way out for you is this sacrifice. And this sacrifice will cover for you. Now, Let's get in a time machine. Anyone? Back to the future? Do you guys remember that movie? I was born in 85, guys. So I was a child in the 90s, right? And that was a cool movie back then. Only because the car was really nice and the neon, like painting on the car. But let's get in a time machine. And let's rewind all the way to the tabernacle in the Old Testament. So I'm going to show you a picture. Also, artist's rendition. Not a real photo, let's be honest. But let's rewind all the way here in the Old Testament. To the... Tabernacle. Now, we've seen creation. I'm just going to recap the story quickly to make sure that we rewind to a place where you can uh, follow the story. We've seen the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. We've seen some chaos that that created. 
we've seen Noah, and God wanting to start over with his family. We've seen Abraham, and God starting over with his family, also making him a promise, right, called the covenant, <laughs> really, really important promise. We've seen Jacob coming from Abraham, and then Isaac, and then uh, uh, Jacob and Esau. We saw Joseph, one of Jacob's sons. We saw Joseph going to Egypt. We've seen the story of Egypt that I referred to earlier. We saw the Israelites under the tyranny of Pharaoh. We've seen God going through a really, really cool 10-round boxing match with Pharaoh and liberating the Israelites from slavery and then crossing through the Red Sea. And now the Israelites are in a phase called the wilderness or space. I mean, that does look wild now, doesn't it? That's where they are, currently stationed. God has given them the law. He started with ten, ten commandments. And shortly after that, the Israelites violated the ten commandments that God gave them by worshipping a golden calf. And then God responds, responds by saying, we need to do some work here. Okay? This is where we'll meet. This is where I will be. And this is where you will meet me. This is where I will teach you who I am and who, who you are and how you should live. Because I'm a holy God and therefore you should be holy. Right? I'm different and therefore you should be different. Because if you are mine and I am yours, we should carry the same marks. And then through God's law, he says, there are rules to this life. I made them and you should obey them. Because if you don't, we've got problems. And a big part of the Old Testament is God explaining to His people why their sin is a really big problem. Because it breaks down what He created. Everything God made was good. And He made human beings in His image very good. And sin keeps on breaking that down. So God had to find a way to stop His people from sinning. And also for them to be able to account for their sins. So, when you sin, you take something, think burger illustration, and when you sin, you need to be cleansed, and you need to be forgiven, and you need to pay. So, the way that God enabled His people to be able to pay was through the practice of animal sacrifice. That's why I reminded us all the way back. Because you would never understand Jesus as an atoning sacrifice if you don't understand this. So God put this practice in place as a way for people to be covered. As a way for people to atone for their sins. As a way for people to erase their debt. As a way for people to be purified and to purify their relationship with God. And that will happen over here. Let me show you another slide. And I just want to show you one station. So in this slide, you'll see a space called the Brazen Altar. Shisanyama. Nay, fire. And then you'll see slaughter tables. And then you'll see another uh, a brazen laver. And then you'll see more stations inside the tent of meeting. But in this first altar, you'll see a man. And you'll see a cow, or a bull, or an ox, ready to be sacrificed. So this is where animal sacrifice happened. Why? Let me show you. Leviticus 17 verse 11. One simple verse. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have appointed it to you to make atonement, there's the word again, on the altar for your lives, since it is the life blood that makes atonement. Listen to what God says in this law. You took life when you sinned. And I created it. And I gave it. And now you are going to pay. And now you can't pay with your own life. Because if you were able to pay with your own life, you had to shed your own blood. And then you'll die. So now I'm going to have to make a way for you to be able to pay, to be cleansed and to be forgiven. Because that's how serious sin is. What I have made, says God, you took. And you need to pay for it. Now, I don't know where you guys land on slaughtering animals. If you grew up in a context other than where we are tonight, you might go, yeah, dude, I mean, that's daily bread and butter. I grew up in Pretoria. My accent should tell you that. <laughs> so slaughtering is it's a vivid experience for me. 
It's quite visceral, you know, to stand there and to see that animal's throat being slit and to see blood gushing from the neck of the animal. If you wanted to atone for your sins in the Old Testament, you stood there in that little tent, in that courtyard where the brazen altar was, and you had to watch how an animal's neck is cut open and how the blood gushes out from that animal's neck. And then you had to stand there and confess that that is what I did when I, whatever it is that you need to cover for. Because that's hardcore. Can you imagine the impact of looking at something being killed and its blood leaving its body and then saying, that's what I did to my neighbor when I called him a name. That's what I did when I lied to my wife. That's what I did when I lied to my employer when I lusted after my neighbor or my mate or my colleagues' um, um, possessions. That's what I did when I disobeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit telling me to do something and I did exactly the opposite. Can you imagine just standing there and seeing that? We need to pause here. Because our sin is nothing small. And that is the truth for you and I if you're a believer. And for you and I if you're not a believer. This is the truth for every single person living on this earth. Is that your debt is huge. And it is unpayable. I surrendered my life to Jesus on the 17th of May 2005. After a failed suicide attempt. So I had two options really. Kill myself and give my life to Christ. I failed in killing myself, so I gave my life to Christ. It was somewhere between 12 and 1 on the carpet in my bedroom, and here was my prayer. I have made a colossal mess of my life, and I'm giving it back to you now. Like, take it. Someone told me that I can say, I'm surrendering my life to you. So here it is. Secretion, tears, lots of weeping, and I eventually made my way into the bed. And I remember getting up the following morning, and no jokes. And I literally sat up straight in my bed. And as I peeked over my shoulder, just to look at my bedside table, <laughs> my sin looked like the Himalaya mountains. Okay? It's huge. Google it if you have never seen the picture. I remember looking over my shoulder and going, Oh my hat. Look at everything I've done. I was so convicted of all my sin. And my first thought was, if I don't sort this out today, God's going to kill me. And then I'm going to go to a bad place. Like that part of the gospel, I kind of knew that there's a good place and a bad place. And I didn't want to go to a bad place. So I called the pastor who gave me his number six months before in a coffee shop. He wore jeans and running shoes with a tucked in shirt that said, Jesus freak. (laughs) <laughs> like, I remember getting his number and thinking, dude, I am not too sure if we will ever hang out. But okay, let me take your number. And I, uh, I rang him. And I'm like, dude, I need to talk to you today. And he goes, why? And I said, well, I surrendered my life to God last night, but it didn't work. So it was a And I'm scared that God might kill me. So you need to help me to sort this out so that if I die today, then I'm going to the good place. And he said, okay, cool, come and see me and we'll talk it through. And I'm like, dude, listen, you, I live on that side of the N1, you live on that side of the N1. It's a busy day. If I have to drive to you, I am going to die. Like traffic circle, 56 ton truck, T-bone, he was a good lad. You know what I mean? Like that's what I saw. And I literally, no jokes, drove to him. I drove a Corsa 160 IS with a free flow exhaust. Just a little bit of rip just a little bit of rip Second gear. 2,000 revs, oh, well, third year, 40 k's an hour, crawled to his house, got there, I sat down, and he said to me, dude, what's bugging you, and I started confessing my sin, and I confessed my sin somewhere between two and a half and three hours, it was a phenomenal experience, I literally just told him everything that I did wrong, and he listened to me, he didn't even take a bathroom break, it's a solid, solid form from there. And I remember after confessing the last thing that I could think of then, I felt like a raisin. 
completely dehydrated, so tired. And he said to me, Rainer, do you know the word grace? And I said to him, I'll be... <coughs> No, yes, no, I've heard of it. Tell me more. And he goes, Grace has covered all of that. You forget it, then. It's done. God doesn't even think about it anymore. It's gone from his memory. Because when he looks at you now, he sees his son. And the righteousness of his son was given to you. And I'm like, what's righteousness? <laughs> and it's like, you have been made right, put into right relationship. You've been given a new status. There's a judgment spoken over your life, and that life is saved. And I was like, this is the best news ever. All of that, the Himalayas, covered. All of it covered by God's grace. That's 2 verse 2. Let's read it again. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. That's yours. And that's yours. And that's yours. And that's ours. And every single person still trying to carry the burden of their Himalayas. That's good news for them as well. This is the good news we preach. This is the good news we speak. This is the good news we share. Atoning sacrifice is no small thing. It's not a fancy schmancy word. It's the word to help us to understand why Jesus had to die and what it means for us. Third question. Did Jesus die because God was angry or because he loves us? Now, after an evening like this with phenomenal worship, you might think, ah, I'll never think that God is actually angry with me. I know his love and that's in his character. And like God and I are good. But when we live in this paradox of life, in which there's two things true at the same time, the one doesn't change and the other one does, we often make the mistake that God is fed up with us. And we often make the mistake that we probably went too far. I mean, back to the burger illustration. If you forget your wallet for like 15 times, we're not going to have lunch anymore. It's going to be a WhatsApp video call. <laughs> I'll be at my house, you can be at yours, I'm going to chow my lunch. But dude, please, come on, get this right now. And because we're human beings, and we can laugh at that illustration, we often import that thought to think that that is the way that God thinks about us. That His grace does run out for us. And that He is angry at us. Because of our own sinful failures, and our own doubt. And maybe even our own works in which we boast. And then things still don't work out the way that we wish it would. And then there's this voice of doubt that comes into our minds and in our hearts and in our spirits that tells us that God is not that pleased with you. And guys, I don't know about you. I mean, I've been serving Jesus now for 17 years. And in these 17 years, I have grown, praise Jesus for that, by God's grace. But I can pinpoint the moments when I forgot that God is only love. And that He always loves me. And that He doesn't get fed up with me. And that His grace is is sufficient for me. So let's take the Bible. And let's let the Bible smash this false uh, uh, belief to pieces. And I really want to pray that the Bible will bring you comfort when we read this. And it will revitalize your spirit. Look at this portion of scripture. I put it all on one slide. Anyone who would ever teach you presentation skills would tell you, dude, that is way too much text for one slide. But I put it on one slide for a reason. I want you to see all the times the word love occurs in this portion of scripture. Look at it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. 13 times the word love And the second mention of atoning sacrifice in 1 John. Where? Smack bang in the middle. Do you guys see it? So look at all the bolds and underlines. And then look at atoning sacrifice in the middle. Let's read it. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. He is love. 
He is not angry. He is love. He is not distant. He is not occupied. He is not apathetic. He is not a human. He is love. Look at verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. This is how we know. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us. And His love is made complete in us. Let me put it to you straight. Real talk. Jesus died because God loves us. God gave sacrifices because He loved His people. And He wanted to create a way for them to be covered. God sent Jesus because He loved His people. Not because he was angry, but because he loved his people. God gave us Jesus to cover for us as the atoning sacrifice. Well, you guys know what the next part of the sentence is. Because he loves us. This is what he has for us. Love and only love. I mentioned earlier that I was born in the 80s. I was a child in the 90s. You guys remember, well, some of you might. You guys remember that advertisement of the, of the flake chocolate? The saying of the Cadbury's chocolate called flake was, one bite and all resistance crumbles. Do you guys remember that ad? Oh my word! The flake gets bitten and then there's a whole, I don't know, abundance of emotions that gets experienced by that person. Let me tell you now. One revelation of God's love for you and all resistance crumbles. We cannot resist God's love. And if He reveals Himself to you in Jesus, His atoning sacrifice, and you see it, you cannot resist it. And all your resistance will crumble. I asked you earlier, what's your love language? Sacrifice is God's love language. And that is how we know that He loves us. The death of Jesus was the perfect death. It was the final word. It was the cover for all that was and all that is to come. And that is the truth. Here's what I want to call you to tonight. Let this scripture... Bring to the fore or into your consciousness and into your heart and into your mind the things that need covering. And then let Him cover it. Because you don't have to. You don't have to pay for it. It's paid. And it's covered. One way in which we will awaken to what God is busy doing in our lives is if we can throw off this burden of having to pay for our sins ourselves. Let the truth of the word speak to us tonight. And let's linger and let's hold space for the spirit to work inside of us. We have uh, two people in our church, well, who came with us from Rooted Fellowship, uh, called Kuliso and Bethany Ramashia. <laughs> Bethany says to me, sometimes she's, she's so angry with her kids She just says, deal, boy, deal. (laughs) And I'm like, hey, that's a really good gospel call. Because if you feel the spirit moving inside of you tonight, deal, boy, or girl, (laughs) deal. Like, don't let the moment pass to hear this and to think about what needs to happen next. Let's deal with whatever it is that God wants to do among us tonight. So, Clarinda, I'm going to ask you first. Come up and uh, she'll be ministering to us and serving us through a song. Then Joy and the Tiro and Fred will also join them and Joy will call us to worship. Let's allow the Spirit to awaken us tonight. 
Let's allow the atoning sacrifice to be revealed to us tonight. Let us allow our normal resistance and all the guilt and the shame that we caught in. Let's allow the Spirit to deal with that decisively tonight. And then, let's praise Him for what He did for us. I don't know about you, but if I read this portion of Scripture, I just want to start writing songs and I'm not even a muso. I just want to start praying prayers of thanks because I cannot believe that Jesus did this for me. Like, think of all the death that I've caused in this world. Think of every time that I've taken life that God has created and made good and given and I've ruined it. And He says, that's okay, I'll cover for you. I'll cleanse you, I'll forgive you, I'll purify you, and I'll cover for you. You don't have to do it yourself. Let's allow the Spirit to minister to us, and then let's praise Him for His goodness, His kindness, His love, and His mercy. Let me pray for us. Father God, I I think of, of You revealing Yourself to this world, and the resistance of this world just crumbling under the revelation of Your love. And then I think about the gift of your son as the atoning sacrifice. That is that revelation. We don't have to wait for the revelation anymore. It's right there. It's Jesus nailed to a cross. Paying for us what we could never pay. Forgiving us and cleansing us and purifying us. And now we can meet you. We don't even have to go to a tent anymore. You live inside of us. You decided to take up residence with us. Meet us where we are now, Father God. You know every head and every heart. You know exactly what we need. Would you meet us? Would you minister to us? Would you cleanse us, purify us? Would you help us to hear in amplified voice that you've covered for us? I praise you, Lord Jesus.